Chapter Fifteen of Flemington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Flemington by Violet Jacob. Chapter Fifteen. Watty has theories. Though Skirling Watty seldom occupied the same bed on many consecutive nights. His various resting places had so great a family likeness that he could not always remember where he was when he chanced to wake in the small hours. Sheds, barns, stables harbored him in the cold months when luck was good. Loanings, old quarries, wind patches, the alder clump beyond Brecon, or the wall side at Magdalen Chapel in the summer. Tonight he lay in the barn a budding on the tiny farmhouse at which he had sought shelter for Archie. He had met with a half-hearted reception from the woman who came to the door. Her man was away, she told him, and she was unwilling to admit strangers in his absence. She had never seen Waddy before, and it was plain that she did not like his looks. He induced her at last, with the greatest difficulty, to give shelter in her barn to the comrade whom he described as lying in extremity at the roadside. Finally, she dispatched her son, a youth of fifteen, to accompany the beggar and to help to bring the sufferer back. Cold water revived Archie again, and he reached the barn with the assistance of the lad, who, better disposed than his mother, cut a bundle of dry heather which he spread in a corner for his comfort. The woman looked with silent surprise at her undesired guest. She had thought to see a fellow traveller of different condition in company with the masterful old blackguard in the cart. Her glances and her expressive silence made Watty uneasy, but there was no help for their plight whilst Flemington could scarcely stand. The beggar had spent the rest of that day in the barn. He was not suffered to enter the farm, nor was he offered any food, but he had enough store by him from what he had collected in Brecon for his own needs and those of his team. Archie's only requirement was the bowl of water that his companion had obtained from the boy. He lay alternately dozing and tossing on his pile of heather. His body was chilled, for his high boots had been full of the esque water, and Waddy had hesitated to draw them off, lest he should be unable to get them on again after their soaking. Night fell on the barn at last. Waddy slept sound with the yellow cur's muzzle against his shoulder, but he awoke towards midnight, for Archie's feverish voice was coming from the corner in which he lay. He inclined his ear, attracted by the recurrent name of Logie, which ran through the disconnected babblings, rising again and again like some half-drowned object, carried along a swift stream. The darkness made every word seem more distinct. "'Listen to me,' cried Flemington. "'Logie! Logie! You do not understand. "'It is safe. It is burnt. "'Nobody shall know it from me. "'I cannot take your money, Logie. "'I will tell you everything, but you will not understand.' "'The beggar was holding his breath. "'I did not guess it was Inchbrayock. "'Thought it would not be Inchbrayock. "'Logie, I will say nothing.' "'but I will tell you all. "'For God's sake, Logie, I swear it is true. "'Listen.' "'Skirling Waddy could hear him struggling "'as though he were fighting for his life. "'Not to Ardguys. "'I cannot go back to Ardguys. "'I shall never tell. "'Never, never tell. "'But I shall know where you are. "'They shall never know.' "'Ah!' cried Archie, raising his voice "'like a man in distress calling for help. "'It is you, Logie. My God, let me go!' A beggar dragged himself nearer. The fragment of moon did no more than turn the chinks and cracks of the barn to a dull grey, and he could hardly see the outline of his companion. The nightmares that were tormenting Archie pointed to something that must have happened before he came by his hurt, and the injury and the chill had produced these light-headed wanderings. There were troubles boiling in his mind that he had kept behind his teeth so long as his tongue was under control. Waddy wondered what was all this talk of Lord Balnillo's brother. It seemed as if there were some secret 
between this man, suspected, as he well knew, of being an active rebel, and Flemington. Had it been light, Wattie would have tried to get at the papers that Archie had spoken of, as being on him when they met, for these might give him some clue to the mystery. He sat in the dark, leaning against the wall of the barn, his arms tightly folded across his great chest, his lips pursed, his gaze bent on the restless figure that he could just distinguish. All at once Archie sat up. "'Where are you?' he asked in a high, strained voice. "'I'm here,' replied the beggar. "'Is it you, Logie?' exclaimed Flemington. "'It's myself.' Wattie smoothed the roughness out of his accent as best he could. The other seemed to be hovering on the brink of consciousness. He sank back. "'It is not Logie,' he said. "'But you can tell him.' Waddy leaned forward and laid his broad palm firmly and very gently on his shoulder. "'What'll I tell him?' said he. Flemington turned towards him and groped about with his hot hand. "'Tell him from me that he can trust me,' he said in a hoarse, earnest whisper. The beggar's touch seemed to quiet him. He lay still, murmuring indistinctly between snatches of silence. Once again he sat up, groping about. "'You will not forget,' he said. "'Na, na,' replied Waddy. He pushed him gently back, patting him now and again as a nurse might pat a restless child, and Archie grew calmer. The hand quieted him. Rough, dirty, guileful, profane as he was, without scruple or conscience or anything but the desire to do the best for himself, Skirling Waddy had got, lodged in body or spirit, or in whatsoever part of man the uncomprehended force dwells, that personal magnetism which is independent alike of grace and of virtue, which can exist in a soil that is barren of either. It may have been that which the yellow cur, with a clear vision belonging to some animals, recognized and adored, seeing not only the coarse and jovial reprobate who was his master, but the shadow of the mysterious power that had touched him. The dog, awakened by Archie's cry, found that the beggar had moved, and drew closer to his side. Flemington dozed off again, and Waddy sat thinking. He longed to stir him up that he might have the chance of hearing more of his rambling talk, but he refrained, not from humane feeling, but from the fear that the talker, if he were tampered with, might be too ill to be moved on the morrow. Sleep was his best chance, and Waddy had made up his mind that if it were possible to move him, he would prevail on the boy to get a beast from the nearest place that boasted anything which could carry him to Aberbrothock. He knew that Flemington could pay for it, and he would direct him to a small inn in that place whose landlord, besides being a retired smuggler, was a distant kinsman of his own. The matter of a passage to Leith could be arranged through the same source for a consideration. Archie should take his chance by himself. He realized with some bitterness the bright opportunities that can be lost upon a being who has no legs to speak of, for he could easily have relieved him of what money he carried had he been an able-bodied man. It was not that he lacked the force for such deeds, but that honesty was wantonly thrust upon him because his comings and goings were so conspicuous. Notoriety takes heavy toll, and he had about the same chance as the king of being conveniently mislaid. He would have given a good deal for a sight of the papers that Archie carried, and though the darkness interfered with him now, he promised himself that he would see them if the morning light should find him still delirious. He could not make out how ill he was, and in spite of his curiosity, he was not prepared to befriend him with the chance of his growing worse. To have him dying upon his hands would be a burden too great to endure, even should it lead to no awkward questionings. He would get rid of him tomorrow, whether his curiosity were satisfied or not, he had heard enough to make him suspect very strongly that Flemington was in the pay of the rebels as well as in that of the king. It was a situation that he, personally, could very well understand. 
but the night turned and Archie grew more peaceful as the hours went by. He had one or two bouts of talking, but they were incoherent and fitful, and his mind appeared now to be straying among different phantoms. There was no more about Logie, and Waddy could only make out the word Ardguise, which he knew as the name of a place beyond Forfar, and as he had discovered in Brecon that Flemington lived somewhere in those parts, he guessed that his thoughts were roving about his home. His breathing grew less labored, and the watcher could hear at last that he slept. The moon dropped, and with her going the crevices lost their grayness, and the barn grew black. The beggar, who was a healthy sleeper, laid himself down again, and in the middle of his cogitations passed into oblivion. When he awoke the place was light, and Archie was looking at him with intelligent eyes. They were hollow, and there were dark shadows below them, but they were the eyes of a man in full possession of his wits. "'We must get out of this place,' he said. "'I have been standing up, but my knees seem so heavy I can hardly walk. "'My bones ache, Waddy. I believe there is fever in me, but I must get on. "'Damn it, man, we are a sorry pair to be cast on the world like this. "'I fear I took terrible liberties with your whisky yesterday.' It was a still, misty morning when the beggar, having harnessed his dogs, went out to look for the boy. When he was gone, Flemington fumbled with his shaking fingers for the different packets that he carried. All were there safely, his letters, his money. He trusted nobody, and he did not like having to trust the beggar. His feverish head and the ague in his bones told him that he could scarcely hope to get to Aberbrothock on foot. His boots were still wet, and a bruise on his hip that he had got in falling yesterday had begun to make itself felt. He propped himself against the wall and reached out for the water beside him. Waddy had been some time away when the barn door opened and the farm woman appeared on the threshold, considering him with suspicious disfavor. He dragged himself to his feet and bowed as though he were standing upon an aubusson carpet instead of upon a pallet of withered heather. The action seemed to confirm her distrust. Madam, said he, I have to thank you for a night's shelter and for this excellent refreshment. You are too good. I drink to you. He raised the broken delf bowl with the drain of water that remained in it. Being conscious of inhospitality, she was not sure how much irony lay in his words, and his face told her nothing. "'It's the last you'll get here,' said she. The more she looked at Flemington, the more she was impressed by his undesirability as a guest. She was one of those to whom anything uncommon seemed a menace. "'Madam, I notice that you dislike me. Why?' "'What are ye?' she inquired after a pause during which he faced her, smiling, his eyebrows raised. "'We are two noblemen travelling for pleasure,' said he. She crossed her arms, snorting. "'Huh!' she exclaimed contemptuously. "'I wish my good man was hame. He'd sort the pair of ye. "'If you think we have any design on your virtue,' he continued, "'I beg you to dismiss the idea. I assure you you are safe with us. "'We are persons of the greatest delicacy,' and my friend is a musician of the first rank. I myself am what you see, your humble servant and admirer. "'Ye're a leerer and a Frenchman,' cried she. Her eyes blazed. A little more provocation, and she might have attacked him. At this moment Waddy's cart drove into the yard behind her, axle-deep in the sea of mud and manure that filled the place. She turned upon the newcomer, she could not deal with Archie, but the beggar was a foe she could understand, and she advanced a whirl of abuse upon him. The yellow dog's growling rose, battling with her strident tones, and Archie, seeing the mischief his tongue had wrought, limped out, fearful of what might happen. "'Stand a while for the dog, woman. He'll have the legs off ye rugged off your hunches. Gin he gets a hold of ye,' roared Waddy as the yellow body leaped and bounded in the traces. Amid a hurricane of snarling and shouts, he contrived, by plying his stick, 
to turn the animals and to get them out of the yard. Archie followed him, but before he did so he paused to turn to his enemy, who had taken shelter in the doorway of the barn. He could not take off his hat to her, because he had no hat to take off, having lost it on Inchbrayock Island, but he blew a kiss from the points of his fingers, with an air that almost made her choke. Waddy, turning back over his shoulder, called angrily to him. He could not understand what he had done to the woman to move her to such a tempest of wrath, but he told himself that, in undertaking to escort Archie, he had made a leap in the dark. He would direct him to his cousin's house of entertainment in Aberbrothock, and return to his own haunts without delay. At the nearest point of road the boy was standing by a sorry-looking nag that he held by the ear. A few minutes later they had parted, and the boy, made happy by the coin he had been given, was returning to the farm, while the beggar, who had also reaped some profit in the last twenty-four hours, watched his late companion disappearing down the road. When he was out of sight he turned his own wheels in the direction of Brecon, and set off at a sober pace for that friendly town. He was singing to himself as he went, first because he owned the price of another bottle of whiskey, secondly because he was delighted to be rid of Flemington, and thirdly because an inspiring idea had come to him. His dogs, by the time they drew him into Brecon, would have done two heavy days' work, and would deserve the comparative holiday he meant to give them. He would spend to-morrow in the town with his pipes, in the company of that congenial circle always ready to spring from the gutter on his appearance, and then, after a good night's rest, and when he should have collected a trifle, he would go on to Forfar and learn for certain whether Archie lived at Ardguys and who might be found there in his absence. His idea was to arrive at the house with the last tidings of the young man, to give an account of the attack on the venture, its surrender, Flemington's injury, and his own part in befriending him. It took some time in these days of slow communication for public news to travel so much as across a county, but even should the tale of the ship have reached Ardguys, the news of Archie could scarcely have preceded him. He hoped to find someone, for preference an anxious mother, who would be sensible of how much he had done for her son. There would be fresh profit there. And not only profit, there was something else for which the beggar hoped, though profit was his main object. He pictured some tender, emotional lady from whose unsuspicious heart he might draw scraps of information that would fit into his own theories. He would try the effect of Logie's name, and there would be no harm in taking a general survey of Flemington's surroundings, and picking up any small facts about him that he could collect. His own belief in Archie's double dealing grew stronger as he jogged along. No doubt that shrewd and unaccountable young man was driving a stiff trade. There was little question in his mind that the contents of the letter he had put into his hands by the alder clump had been sold to Captain James Logie and that its immediate result had been the taking of the ship. He had learned from Archie's ravings that there had been a question of money between himself and Logie. A part that he could make nothing of was the suggestion, conveyed by Archie in the night, that he and the judge's brother had been fighting. "'Let me go, Logie!' he had cried out in the darkness, and the blow on his forehead, which was bleeding when he found him, proved recent violence." But though he could not explain these puzzles, nor make them tally with his belief, his theory remained. Flemington was in league with Logie. For the present, he determined to keep his suspicions to himself. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of Flemington This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Flemington by Violet Jacob. Chapter 16. The Two Ends of the Line. Three days afterwards, Wattie sat at the gates of Ardguys, 
and looked between the pale yellow ash trees at the house. There was nobody about at the moment to forbid his entrance, and he drove quietly in at a foot's pace and approached the door. The sun shone with the clear lightness of autumn, and the leaves, which had almost finished the fitful process of falling, lay gathered in heaps by the gate, for Madame Flemington liked order. On the steep pitch of the ancient slate roof a few pigeons, white and grey, sat in pairs or walked about with spasmodic dignity. The whole made a picture, high in tone, like a watercolour, and the clean etched lines of the stripped branches gave it a sharp delicacy and threw up the tall light walls. All these things were lost upon the beggar. He had informed himself in Forfar. He knew that the place was owned and lived in by a lady of the name of Flemington, who was the grandmother of the young man from whom he had lately parted. He had learned nothing of her character and politics because of the seclusion in which she lived, and he stared about him on every side and scanned the house for any small sign that might give him a clue to the tastes or occupations of its inhabitant. Whilst he was so engaged, the front door opened, and the sound sent all the pigeons whirling from the roof into the air in flashes of grey-blue and white. Madame Flemington stood on the top step. The beggar's hand went instinctively to his bonnet. He was a little taken aback, why he did not know, and he instantly abandoned his plan of an emotional description of Archie's plight. She stood quite still, looking down at him. Her luxuriant silver hair was covered by a three-cornered piece of black lace that was tied in a knot under her chin, and she wore the calash, or hood, with which the ladies of those days protected their headdresses when they went out. A short furred cloak was round her. She considered Waddy with astonishment, then she beckoned to him to approach. "'Who and what are you?' she asked, laying her hand on the railing that encircled the landing of the steps. That question was so seldom put to him that it struck him unawares, like a stone from behind a hedge. He hesitated. "'I've got news for your ladyship,' he began. "'I asked your name,' said Madame Flemington. "'Watty cared,' replied he. "'Skirling Watty, they call me.' The countryside and its inhabitants did not appeal to Christian, but this amazing intruder was like no one she had ever seen before. She guessed that he was a beggar, and she brushed aside his announcement of news as merely a method of attracting attention. "'You are one of the few persons in these parts who can afford to keep a coach,' she remarked. A broad smile overspread his ribald countenance like the sun irradiating a public house. "'Dod, my lady, I'd think shame to visit ye on foot,' said he, with a wag of his head. "'You have better reasons than that,' she replied rather grimly. "'Ay, ay, there by the wa,' said he, looking at the place where his legs should have been. "'I'm an ill-sicked for the salters.' She threw back her head and laughed a little. She had seen no one for months, with the exception of Archie, who was so quick in mind and speech— and the humour of this vagabond on wheels took her fancy. There was no whining servility about him in spite of his obvious profession. The horrified face of a maidservant appeared for one moment at a window, then vanished, struck back by the unblessed sight of her mistress, that paralyzing, unapproachable power, jesting, apparently, with skirling Watty, the lowest of the low. The girl was a native of Forfar, the westernmost part of the beggar's travels, and she had often seen him in the streets. "'You face life boldly,' said Madame Flemington. "'And what for no? Fegs greet and fills nobody's kite.' She laughed again. "'You shall fill yours handsomely,' said she. "'Go to the other door, and I will send orders to the women to attend to you.' "'I will I,' he exclaimed. "'but as wasna just for a piece that a came all the way for the Muir o' Rossi.' "'From where?' said she. "'The Muir of Rossi,' repeated he. "'My lady, it was a wa yonder at the tail o' the Muir "'that I tellt Maister Flemington the road to Aberothock.' "'Mr. Flemington? 
"'Ay, yon lad Flemington, and a divil of a lad he is to tack the road with. "'My lady, there's been a puckly feckin about Montrose, "'and the prince's men he gotten a hold of King George's ship that's in by Ferryden. "'As I gaed down to the tune, I cape it with Flemington i the road. "'He gotten a clure on his head. "'He was feckin doon about inch break, he tellt me.' "'Fighting? With whom?' asked Madame Flemington, fixing her tiger's eyes on him. The beggar had watched her face narrowly while he spoke for the slightest flicker of expression that might indicate the way her feelings were turning. "'He was fechtum with Captain Logie,' he continued boldly. "'A fell man, Jan. Ye'll ken him, your ladyship?' "'By name,' said Christian. "'I'm thinking it was fra him that he got the clower on his heed. I guide him on my good whisky bottle, and I got water to him fra a well. I kaid him a wa fra the roadside. He didn't a ken what will be after him, you see, and I gared a clatterin' old wife at the muir side guys a shelter yon nicked. I didn't a leave the callant, my lady, till I got a shelt to him. He's in Edinburgh. I tellt him what get him a passage to Leith. I'm an Aberbrothock man myself, ye ken. "'And did he send you to me?' "'Aye, did he,' said he, lying boldly. There was no sign of emotion, none even of surprise on her face. Her heart had beaten hard as the beggar talked, and the weight of wrath and pain that she had carried since she had parted with Archie began to lighten. He had listened to her. He had not gone against her. How deep her words had fallen into his heart she could not tell but deep enough to bring him to grips with the man who had made the rift between them. "'Are you sure of what you say?' she asked quickly. "'Did you see them fight?' "'Na, na, but twas the lad himself that tellt me. "'He was on the ship.' "'He was on the ship?' "'Aye, was he, and he gaed oot with the soldiers to deave they rebels for inch break. "'They got the ship, my lady, but they didna get him. "'He escapit.' "'Did you say he was much hurt?' said Madame Flemington. "'Hoots, ye needna fash yourself, my lady. "'I was feared for him in the nicht, "'but there wasna muckle rang with him when he gaed awa, "'or dad I wouldna ha' left him.' "'He had no mind to spoil his presentment of himself as good Samaritan. "'So far he had learnt nothing. "'He had spoken of the prince's men as rebels "'without a sign of displeasure showing on Madame Flemington's face. Archie might be playing a double game, and she might be doing the same, but there was nothing to suggest it. She was magnificently impersonal. She had not even shown the natural concern that he expected with regard to her own flesh and blood. "'Go now,' said she, waving her hand towards the back of the house. "'You shall feed well, you and your dogs, and when you have finished you can come to these steps again,' and I will give you some money. You have done well by me. She re-entered the house, and he drove away to the kitchen door, dismissed. If Waddy hoped to discover anything more there about the lady and her household, he was disappointed. The servants raised their chins in refined disapproval of the vagrant upon whom their mistress had seen fit to waste words under the very front windows of Ardguy's. They resolved that he should find the back door socially a different place, and only the awe in which they stood of Christian compelled them to obey her to the letter. A crust or two would have interpreted her wishes, had they dared to please themselves. But Madame Flemington knew every resource of her larder and kitchen, for French housekeeping and the frugality of her exiled years had taught her thrift. She would measure precisely what had been given to her egregious guest down to the bones laid by her order before his dogs. The beggar ate in silence amid the brisk cracking made by five pairs of busy jaws. The maids were in the stronghold of the kitchen, far from the ungenteel sight of his coarse enjoyment. When he had satisfied himself, he put the fragments into his leathern bag and went round once more to the front of the house. A window was open on the ground floor, and Madame Flemington's large white hand came over the sill 
holding a couple of crown pieces. She was sitting on the window seat within. Her cloak and the calish had disappeared, and Wattie could see the fine poise of her head. She dropped the coin into the cart as he drove below. As he looked up, he thought that if she had been imposing in her outer garments, she was a hundredfold more so without them. He was at his ease with her, but he wondered at it, though he was accustomed to being at his ease with everybody. A certain vanity rose in him, coarse remnant of humanity as he was, before this magnificent woman, and when he had received the silver he turned about, facing her, and began to sing. He was used to the plebeian admiration of his own public, but a touch of it from her would have a different flavor. He was vain of his singing, and that vanity was the one piece of romance belonging to him. It hung over his muddy soul as a weaving of honeysuckle may hang over a dank pond. Had he understood Madame Flemington perfectly, he might have sung the Todd, but as he only understood her superficially, he sang Logie Kirk. He did not know how nearly the extremities of the social scale can draw together in the primitive humours of humanity. It is the ends of a line that can best be bent to meet, not one end and the middle. Yet, as Logie Kirk ran out among the spectral ash trees, she sat still, astonished, her head erect like some royal animal listening. It moved her, though its sentiment had naught to do with her mood at present, nor with her cast of mind at any time. But love and loss are things that lay their shadows everywhere, and Madame Flemington had lost much. Moreover, she had been a woman framed for love, and she had not wasted her gifts. As his voice ceased, she rose and threw the window up higher. "'Go on,' she said. He paused, taking breath for a couple of minutes. He knew songs to suit all political creeds, but this time he would try one of the Jacobite lays that were floating round the country. If it should provoke some illuminating comment from her, he would have learned something more about her, and incidentally about Archie, though it struck him that he was not so sure of the unanimity of interest between the grandmother and grandson which he had taken for granted before seeing Madame Flemington. His cunning eyes were rooted on her as he sang again. My love stood at the lone and side, and held me by the hand, the bonniest lad that e'er did bide in all this wayful land. There's but thy bonnier to be seen, fra Pentland to the sea, and for his sake but yestereen I sent my love from me. I guide my love the white, white rose that's at my feather's wa. It is the bonniest flower that grows where ilka flower is bra. There's but I braher than I can fra Perth unto the main, and that's the flower of Scotland's men that's fechtin for his ain. If I had kept what e'er was mine as I had guide my best, my hair twere licked by day and zine, the nicht what bring me rest. There is nae heavier heart to find from far far tune to air, as I I sit me doon to mind on him I see nae mair. Lad, gin ye fall by Charlie's side to rid this land of shame, there will not be a prouder bride than her ye left at hame. But I will see ye war ye sleep fra lowlands to the peat, and ilka nicht at mirk I'll creep to lay me at your feet. You sing well, said Christian, when he had stopped. Now go. She inclined her head and turned from the window. As his broad back, so grotesque in its strange nearness to the ground, 
passed out between the gateposts of Ardguys, she went over to the mantelpiece. Her face was set, and she stood with clasped hands gazing into the fireplace. She was deeply moved, but not by the song, which only stirred her to bitterness, but by the searching tones of the becker's voice that had smitten a way through which her feelings surged to and from her heart. The thought that Archie had not utterly broken away from her unnerved her by the very relief it brought. She had not known till now how much she had suffered from what had passed between them. Her power was not all gone. She was not quite alone. She would have scorned to admit that she could not stand in complete isolation, and she admitted nothing even to herself. She only stood still, her nerves quivering, making no outward sign. Presently she rang a little handbell that was on the table. The genteel-minded maid appeared. "'Misey,' said Madame Flemington, "'in three days I shall go to Edinburgh.'" End of chapter 16「Seventeen of Flemington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Flemington by Violet Jacob. Chapter 17. Society. Lord Balnillo looked out of his sedan chair as it emerged from the darkness of a close on the northern slope of the old town of Edinburgh. Far down in front of him, where the long alley stopped, a light or two was seen, reflected in the black water of the Nor Loch that lay between the ancient city and the ground on which the new one was so soon to rise. The shuffling footfalls of his chairman echoing off the sides of the covered entry, were drowned in the noise that was going on a little way further forward, where the close widened out into a square courtyard. One side of this place was taken up by the house of Lady Anne Maxwell, for which the judge was bound. It had been raining, and Edinburgh was most noisomely dirty underfoot, so Balnillo's regard for his silk-clad legs and the buckled shoes on his slim feet had made him decide to be carried to his kinswoman's party. He wore his favorite mouse color, but the waistcoat under his velvet coat was of primrose satin, and the lace under his chin had cost him more than he liked to remember. The courtyard sent up a glow of light into the atmosphere of the damp evening, for the high houses towering round it rose black into the sky limiting the shine and concentrating it into one patch. From above it must have looked like a dimly illuminated well. It was full of sedan chairs, footmen, lantern carriers, and caddies, and the chattering, pushing, jesting, and oaths were keeping the inhabitants of the neighboring lands, such of them as were awake, for Edinburgh kept early hours in those days, from going to sleep. The sedan chairs were set down at the door, for they could seldom be carried into the low and narrow entrances of even the best town houses, and here, at Lady Anne's, the staircase wound up inside a circular tower projecting from the wall. The caddies, or street messengers of Edinburgh, that strange brotherhood of useful, omniscient rascals, without whose services nothing could prosper, ran in and out among the crowd in search of odd jobs. Their eyes were everywhere, their ears heard everything, their tongues carried news of every event. The caddies knew all that happened in society, on the bench, in shops, in winds, in churches, and no traveller could be an hour in the town before they had made his name and business common property. In an hour and a half his character would have gone the same way. Their home by day was at the Market Cross in the High Street, where they stood in gossiping groups until a call let one of them loose upon somebody else's business. It was the perpetual pursuit of other people's business that had made them what they were. 
a knot of caddies pressed round the door of Lady Anne Maxwell's house, as Lord Balnillo, sitting erect in order not to crease his clothes, and looking rather like an image carried in a procession, was kept at a standstill whilst another guest was set down. Through the open window of his chair there pressed a couple of inquisitive faces. "'Hey, lads!' cried a caddy. "'It's Davy Balnillo back again!' "'Losh, it's himself! A weel, my lord, we're fine and pleased to see ye. Grange is awa and ben the hoose. I's warrant he doesna ken was a hid him. Balnillo nodded affably. The instant recognition pleased the old man, for he had only reached Edinburgh in time to dress for his cousin's party. Also, Lord Grange was a, a friend of his, and he was glad to hear that he was in front. As he looked complacently upon the crowd, his chairman suddenly stepped forward, almost throwing him out of his seat. A cry rose round him. "'Canny, canny, ye highland devils! Ye ha the powered wiggy of him swigget aft his heed! Hod on, Davy, we'll no let ye cop!' Balnillo was rather annoyed, for he had been knocked smartly against the window frame, and a little cloud of powder had been shaken on his velvet sleeve. But he knew that the one thing a man might not lose before the caddies was his temper. If he did not want his rage, his gestures, and all the humiliating details of his discomfiture to be the town talk next day, he looked as bland as he could while he resettled himself. "'It'll no be war nor riding the circuit, my lord,' inquired a voice. A laugh went round the group and the chair moved on and was set down at its destination. Though the caddy's knowledge of the judge went as far down as his foibles, the one thing that they did not happen to know was the motive that had brought him to Edinburgh. The doings in the harbour had disturbed Balnillo mightily, for, though the success of Ferrier and James in taking the venture rejoiced him, he was dismayed by what he had heard about Archie Flemington. His brother had told him everything. When Captain Hall and his men had been conveyed as prisoners to the town, and the ship had been taken possession of by Prince Charles's agent in Montrose, Logie had gone hastily to Balnillo to give the news to David, and to prepare for his own departure to join the Stuart army. There was no longer any need for secrecy on his part, and it had always been his intention to declare himself openly as soon as he had done his work in Montrose. The place was well protected, and besides the town guns that he and Ferrier had taken from Hall, there were the two armed vessels, both now belonging to the prince, lying in the harbour. The arrival of the frigate with her supplies had turned Montrose from a rebelliously inclined town into a declared Jacobite stronghold. The streets and taverns were full of Lord John Drummond's troops. The citizens had given vent to their feelings upon the town bells. Bonfires blazed in the streets, and Prince Charlie's name was on every lip. Girls wore white roses on their breasts, and dreamed at night of the fascinating young spark who had come to set Scotland alight. The intense Jacobitism of Angus seemed to have culminated in the quiet seaport. In all this outburst of loyalty and excitement, the cautious Balnillo did not know what to do. The risk of announcing his leanings publicly was a greater one than he cared to take, for his stake in the country and the land was considerable, and he was neither sanguine enough to feel certain of the ultimate triumph of the Stuarts, like the Montrose people, nor generous enough to disregard all results like James. As he told himself, after much deliberation, he was best away. He had heard from James of Archie's sudden appearance upon the island, armed with a government weapon and in company with the attacking force from the ship, and had listened to James's grim denunciation of him as a spy, his passionate regrets that he had not blown his brains out there and then. James's bitterness had been so great that David told himself he could scarcely recognize his quiet brother. There was abundant reason for it, 
but Logie had seemed to be beside himself. He had scarcely eaten or slept during the short time that he had been with him, and his face had kept the judge's tongue still. After his account of what had happened, Balnillo had not returned to the subject again. Step by step the judge had gone over all the circumstances of Flemington's sudden emergence from the den on that windy night, and had seen how he had himself been cozened and flattered into the business of the portrait which stood unfinished in solitary and very marked dignity in the room with the north light. He was a man who suspected some of his own weaknesses, though his knowledge did not prevent him from giving way to them when he thought he could do so safely, and he remembered the adroit bits of flattery that his guest had strewn in his path, and how obligingly he had picked them up. He was shrewd enough to see all that. His thought of the sudden departure when Madame Flemington's mysterious illness had spirited Archie out of the house at a moment's notice, and he saw how he had contrived to imbue both himself and James with the idea that he shared their political interests, without saying one definite word. He thought of his sigh and the change in his voice as he spoke of his father's death in exile with his master. These things stood up in a row before Balnillo and ranged themselves into a sinister whole. The plain truth of it was that he had entertained a devil unawares. There had been a great search for Flemington when the skirmish on Inchbrayock was over. It was only ceasing when the French frigate swam into the river mouth like a huge water bird, and James, plunged in the struggle, was unable to spare a thought to the antagonist he had flung from him at the first sound of the attack. But when the firing had stopped and the appearance of the foreign ship made the issue of the conflict certain, he returned to the spot where he had left Archie and found him gone. He examined the sand for some trace of the vanished man's feet, but the tide was now high in the river and his footprints had been swallowed by the incoming rush. The stepping stones were completely covered and he knew that these, great fragments of rock as they were, would now be lying under enough water to drown a man who should miss his footing while the tide surged through this narrow stretch of the Esk's bed. He guessed that the spy had escaped by them, though a short time later the attempt would have been impossible. He made a hasty search of the island, and finding no sign of Flemington, he returned with his men and the prisoners they had taken leaving the dead to be carried over later to the town for burial. The boats were on the Montrose side of Inchbrayock, and their progress being hampered by the wounded, some time was lost before he could spare a handful of followers to begin the search for Flemington. He picked up a few volunteers upon the quays, and dispatched them immediately to cross the strait and to search the southern shores of both the river and the basin but they had barely started when Flemington and the beggar were nearing the little farm on Rossy Moor. Archie had spent so little time on the open road, thanks to his companion's advice, that none of those whom the pursuers met and questioned had seen him. Before dusk came on, their zeal had flagged, and though one quicker-witted than his comrades had suggested the moor as a likely goal for their quarry, he had been overborne by their determination that the fugitive, a man who had been described to them as coming from the other side of the county, would make in that direction. When James had gone to join the Stuart army on its march to England, his brother, waiting until the prince had left Holyrood, set forth for Edinburgh. It would have been difficult for him to remain at home within sound of the noisy rejoicings of Montrose without either joining in the general exultation or holding himself conspicuously aloof. Prudence and convenience pointed to the taking of a little holiday, and his own inclination did not gainsay them. He had not been in Edinburgh since his retirement, and the notion of going there, once formed, grew more and more to his taste. A hundred things in his old haunts drew him, 
gossip, the liberal tables of his former colleagues, the latest modes in coats and cravats, the musical assemblies at which he had himself performed upon the flute, the scandals and anecdotes of the Parliament House, and the society of elegant women. He loved all these, though his trees and parks had taken their places of late. He loved James, too, and the year they had spent together had been agreeable to him. But politics and family affection, the latter of the general rather than the individual kind, strong as their bonds were, could not bring the brothers into true touch with each other. James was preoccupied, silent, restless, and David had sometimes felt him to be inhuman in his lack of interest in small things and in his carelessness of all but the great events of life. And now, as Balnillo stepped forth at Lady Anne Maxwell's door, he was hugging himself at the prospect of his return to the trimmings and embroideries of existence. He walked up the circular staircase and emerged into the candlelight of the long, low room in which his cousin's guests were assembled. Lady Anne was a youngish widow with a good fortune and a devouring passion for cards. She had all the means of indulging her taste, for not only did she know every living being who went to the making of Edinburgh society, but unlike most of her neighbors, she owned the whole of the house in which she lived, and consequently had space wherein to entertain them. While nearly all the Edinburgh world dealt in its flat, and while many greater ladies than herself were contented to receive their guests in their bedchambers, and to dance and drink tea in rooms not much bigger than the boudoirs of their descendants, Lady Anne could have received Prince Charles Edward himself in suitable circumstances, had she been so minded. But she was very far from having any such aspiration, and had not set foot in Holyrood while the prince was there for she was a staunch Whig. As she greeted her cousin Balnillo, she was wondering how far certain rumors that she had heard about him were true, and whether he also had been privy to the taking of the sloop of war in Montrose Harbor. For it was just a week since the news of Logie's exploit had reached Edinburgh. One of David's many reasons for coming to her party was his desire to make his reappearance in the polite world in a markedly Whig house. He stood talking to Lord Grange in the oak-panelled room, half full of people. Through an open door another smaller apartment could be seen, crowded with tables and card-players. Lady Anne, all of whose guests were arrived, had vanished into it, and the two judges stood side by side. Lord Grange, who valued his reputation for sanctity above rubies, did not play cards, at least not openly, and Balnillo, discovering new faces, as those must who have been over a year absent from any community, was glad to have him at his elbow to answer questions. Silks rustled, fans clicked, and the medley of noises in the court below came up, though the windows were shut. The candles, dim enough to our modern standards of lighting, shone against the darkness of polished wood, and laughter and talk were escaping like running water out of a thicket from a knot of people gathered round a small, plump, aquiline-nosed woman. The group was at the end of the room, and now and again an individual de would detach himself from it to return, drawn by some jest that reached him ere he had crossed the floor. "'Mrs. Cockburn's wit has not rusted this twelve-month,' observed Lord Grange. "'I marvel she has any left after nine years of housekeeping with her straight-laced father-in-law,' replied Balnillo, in a preoccupied voice. His eyes were elsewhere. "'Ah!' said Grange, pulling a righteous face. The group round Mrs. Cockburn opened, and she caught sight of him for the first time. She bowed and smiled civilly, showing her rather prominent teeth. Then, noticing Balnillo, she came over to the two men. Her friends stepped apart to let her pass, 
watching her go with that touch of proprietary pride which a small intimate society feels in its more original members it was evident that her least acts were deemed worthy of observation as she greeted david he turned round with a low bow my lord i thought you were buried she exclaimed dead and buried droned grange for the sake of saying something not dead exclaimed she else i had been in mourning balnillo bowed again bringing his attention back with a jerk from the direction in which it had been fixed come my lord what have you been doing all this long time i have been endeavouring to improve my estate ma'am and meanwhile you have left us to deteriorate for shame sir edinburgh morals are safe in lord grange's hands rejoined balnillo with a sudden flash of slyness mrs cockburn smiled behind her fan there were odd stories afloat about grange she looked appreciatively at balnillo he had not changed in spite of his country life he was as dapper as ineffective and as unexpected as ever she preferred him infinitely to grange fie davy broke in the latter with a leer you are an ungallant dog here is mrs cockburn wasting her words on you and you do nothing but ogle the lady yonder by the window three pairs of eyes the bright ones of mrs cockburn the rather furtive ones of balnillo and the sanctimonious orbs of lord grange turned in one direction mrs cockburn is all knowledge as she is all goodness observed the last named pompously pray madam tell us who is that lady end of chapter 17chapter eighteen of flemington this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nan dodge flemington by violet jacobs chapter eighteen balnillo finds perfection a sconce of candles beside a window recess shed a collective illumination from the wall, and Christian Flemington stood full in their light, contemplating the company with superb detachment, and pervaded by that air which never left her of facing the world unaided and unabashed, with such advantages as God had given her. Her neck, still white and firm, was bare, for she wore no jewels but the ruby earrings which shot blood-red sparks around her when she moved long necks were in fashion in those days and hers was rather short but the carriage of her head added enough to its length to do more than equalize the difference her hair was like massed silver and her flesh of which a good deal could be seen rose like ivory above the wine color of her silk gown which flowed in spreading folds from her waist to the ground a spanish fan with carved tortoiseshell sticks a thing of mellow browns and golds was half closed between her fingers when she opened it it displayed the picture of a bullfight that is mrs flemington madam flemington as i am told many people call her i presume because she came to scotland from france you should know her my lord she added addressing balnillo you are from angus but balnillo was speechless Grange, who was transferring a pinch of snuff from his box to his nose, paused, his hand midway between the two. "'Is she the widow of Andrew Flemington, who was in France with King James?' "'The same,' replied Mrs. Cockburn, tossing her head. She had small sympathy with the Stuarts. "'I had not expected to see the lady here. Not that I know aught about her views. We have a bare acquaintance, and she is like yourself, Lord Balnillo, just arrived in edinburgh when our young hero has left holyrood she has been a fine woman said lord grange his eyes kindling you may use the present tense my lord said mrs cockburn aha sniggered grange who adhered to the time-honoured beliefs of his sex you dare to show yourself generous 
I dare to show myself what I am, and that is more than all the world can do, said she, looking at him very hard. He shifted from foot to foot. At this moment the gallows, to which he had condemned a few people in his time, struck him as a personal inconvenience. Ma'am, said he, swallowing his rage, you must present Davy, or he will lose what senses he has. Come then, my lord, I will befriend you, said she, glad of the chance to be rid of Grange. Balnillo followed her, unable to escape had he wished to do so. Christian was a woman who stood very still. She turned her head without turning her body as Mrs. Cockburn approached her with request, and Balnillo saw her calm acquiescence. His breath had been almost taken away as he learned the identity of the stranger. Here was the woman who knew everything about that astounding young man, his late guest, whose alarming illness had recalled him, who had lived at St. Germain with the exiled queen, yet who was the grandmother of a most audacious Whig spy. There was no trace of recent ill health here. He had pictured some faint, feeble shred of old womanhood, not the commanding creature whose grey eyes were considering him as he advanced under cover of her leisurely consent. She seemed to measure him carelessly as he stood before her. He was torn asunder in mind, awestruck, dragged this way by his surprised admiration, that way by his intense desire to wring from her something about Flemington. Here was a chance, indeed but Balnillo felt his courage drown in the rising fear of being unable to profit by that chance. Admiring bewilderment overcame every other feeling. He no longer regretted the price he had paid for the lace on his cravat. His name had roused Madame Flemington, though she gave no sign of the thrill that went through her as it fell from Mrs. Cockburn's lips. As David stood before her in the correct yet sober foppery of his primrose and mouse color, she regretted that she was quite ignorant of the pretext on which Archie had left his picture unfinished, nor upon what terms he had parted with the judge. She had no reason for supposing Balnillo to be aware of the young man's real character. He had been fighting with James Logie, according to Skirling Wattie yet there seemed to be no enmity in the business. For here was his brother, Lord Balnillo, assiduous in getting himself presented to her. Mrs. Cockburn had put her request with a smiling hint at the effect she had produced on his lordship. Christian glanced at David's meticulous person and smiled, arrogantly civil, secretly anxious, and remained silent, ready to follow his lead with caution. The shrewd side of Balnillo was uppermost to-night, stimulated perhaps by the sight of society and by the exhilarating sound of its voice. He recovered his momentarily scattered wits, and determined to approach his new acquaintance with such direct and simple questions as might seem to her to be the natural inquiries of a man interested in Flemington, and innocent of any mystery concerning him. It was quite possible, so he reasoned, that she was unaware of the details of what had happened on Inchbrayock Island. Archie had fled, and the search for him had produced no result. He was unlikely to have made for his own home if he did not wish to be found, and he and Madame Flemington might not have met since the affair of the venture. It should be his, Balnillo's, task to convince her of his ignorance. His intense curiosity about Archie was almost stronger than his wrath against him. Unlike James, whose bitterness was too deep for words, whose soul was driven before the fury of his own feelings like a restless ghost, David still looked back with a certain pleasant excitement to Flemington's meteoric flash through the even atmosphere of his daily life. He would dearly have liked to bring him to justice, but he was anxious to hear a little more of him first. He had a curious mixture of feelings about him. There was no vainer man in Scotland than Balnillo, and if the mental half of his vanity had suffered from the deception practiced on it, the physical half was yet preening itself in the sunny remembrance of the portrait at home, 
the portrait of David Balnillo as he would fain have had the world see him, the portrait, alas and alas, unfinished. He could not feel quite as James felt, who had opened his purse, and more, far more than that, had laid open the most sacred page of his life before Flemington. He had placed his personal safety in his hands, too, though he counted that as a matter of less moment. Madam, said Balnillo, to see you is to rejoice that you have recovered from your serious illness. You are very obliging, my lord. I am quite well, replied Christian, concealing a slight surprise at this remark. I am most happy in being presented to you, he continued. What news have you of my charming friend, Mr. Flemington, may I ask? When I heard your name, my lord, I determined to be acquainted with you, if only to thank you for your kindness to my boy. He could not say enough of yourself and your brother. I hope Captain Logie is well. Is he with you this evening? The mention of James acted on David, as he had designed that the mention of Archie should act on Madame Flemington. These two people, who were playing at innocence, were using the names of their relations to scare the enemy as savage tribes use the terrific faces painted on their shields. Balnillo, in beginning the attack, had forgotten his own weak point, and he remembered that he could give no satisfactory account of his brother at the present moment. But his cunning was always at hand. "'I had half expected to see him here,' said he, peering round the room. There was some talk of his coming. I arrived somewhat late and I have hardly spoken to any one but my Lord Grange and Mrs. Cockburn. The sight of yourself, ma'am, put other matters out of my head. Ah, sir, exclaimed Christian, I fear that your ardour was all on behalf of Archie, but I am accustomed to that. She cast a look of indolent raillery at him, drawing back her head and veiling her eyes, fiery and seductive still, with the momentary sweep of their thick lashes. Balnillo threw out his chest like a powder pigeon. He had not been so happy for a long time. As he did so, she remembered Archie's account of his silk legs, and his description of him as being silly, virtuous, and cunning all at once. Silly she could well believe him to be. Virtuous he might be. Whether he was cunning or not, time would show her. She did not mean to let him go until she had at least attempted to hear more about James Logie. Madam, said he, since seeing you I have forgotten Mr. Flemington. Can I say more? So far she was completely puzzled as to how much he knew about Archie, but it was beginning to enter her mind that her own illness, of which she had just learned from him, had been the young man's pretext for leaving his work when it was only begun. Why else had the judge mentioned it? And who but Flemington could have put the idea into his head? She determined to make a bold attack on possibilities. Archie was distracted by my illness, poor boy, and I fear that your lordship's portrait suffered. But you will understand his anxiety when I tell you that I am the only living relation that he has, and that his devotion to me. He needs no excuse, cried David fervently. She laid her hand upon his arm. "'I am still hardly myself,' she said. "'I cannot stand long. Fetch me a chair, my lord.' He skipped across the floor and laid hold upon one just in time, for a gentleman was on the point of claiming it. He carried it back with the air of a conqueror. "'Apart, by the curtain, if you please,' said Christian, waving her hand. We can speak more comfortably on the fringe of this rout of chattering people. He set the chair down in a quiet place by the wall, and she settled herself upon it, leaning back, her shoulder turned from the company. Balnillo's delight deepened. And the portrait, my lord, he did not tell me what arrangement had been made for finishing it, said Christian, looking up at him as he stood beside her. She seemed to be completely unconcerned, and she spoke with a leisurely dignity and ease that turned his ideas upside down. He could make nothing of it. She appeared to court the subject of Archie and the picture. He could only guess her to be innocent, and his warm admiration helped his belief. 
At no moment since he knew the truth from his brother's lips had Archie's character seemed so black as it did now. David's indignation waxed as he grew more certain that Flemington had deceived the noble woman to whom he owed so much, even as he had deceived him. He was becoming so sure of it that he had no desire to enlighten her. He longed to ask plainly where Archie was, but he hesitated. Even the all-wise Mrs. Cockburn was ignorant of this lady's political sympathies, and knew her only as the widow of a loyal exile. What might, what would be her feelings, if she were to see her grandson in his real character? Righteous anger smoldered under Balnillo's primrose waistcoat, and his spasmodic shrewdness began to doze in the increasing warmth of his chivalrous pity for this new and interesting victim of the engaging rogue. Mr. Flemington's concern was so great when he left my house that no arrangement was made, said he. I had not the heart to trouble him with my unimportant affairs, when so much was at stake. But the two cautious people who were feeling their way in the dark, it was the judge who was the more mystified, for he had laid hold of a definite idea, and it was the wrong one. Christian was merely putting a bold face on a hazardous matter, and hoping to hear something of Logie. She had not sought the introduction. David would have been the butt of her amused scorn had she been free enough from anxiety to be entertained, but she could not imagine on what footing matters really stood, and she was becoming inclined to suspect the beggar's statement that Flemington had been fighting with James. Her longing to see Archie was great. She loved him in her own way, though she had driven him from her in her mortification and her furious pride. She had not believed that he would really go there and then, that he, who had served her purposes so gallantly all his life, would take her at her word. What was he doing? Why had he gone to Edinburgh? Her own reason for coming had been the hope of seeing him. She had been four days in the town now, and she dared not make open inquiries for him, not knowing how far his defection had gone. She had accused him of turning to the Stuarts, and he had denied the accusation, not angrily, but with quiet firmness. Two horrible possibilities had occurred to her. One, that he was with the prince and might be already known to the government as a rebel. The other, that he had never reached Edinburgh, that his hurt had been worse than the beggar supposed, and that he might be ill or dying, perhaps dead. But it was only when she lay awake at night that she imagined these things. In saner moments, and by daylight, she put them from her. She was so well accustomed to being parted from him, and to the knowledge that he was on risky business, that she would not allow herself to be really disturbed. She assured herself that she must wait and watch, and now she was glad to find herself acquainted with Balnillo, who seemed to be the only clue in her hand. Mercifully, he had all the appearance of being an old fool. "'I see that you are too modest to tell me anything of the picture,' she began. "'I hope it promised well. "'You should make a fine portrait, and I believe that Archie could do you justice. "'He is at his best with high types. "'Describe it to me.' "'David espied a vacant chair, and drawing it towards him, sat down to the subject "'with the same gusto that most men bring to their dinners. "'He cleared his throat. I should have wished it to be full length, said he, but Mr. Flemington had no suitable canvas with him. I wore my robes, and he was good enough to say that the crimson was appropriate and becoming to me. Personally, I favor quiet colors, as you see, ma'am. I see that you have excellent taste. He bowed, delighted. I remarked you as you came in, continued she, and I asked myself— why these gentlemen looked so garish. Observe that one beside the door of the card-room, my lord. I'm sure that he chose his finery with some care, yet he reminds me of a clown at a merry-making. True, true, excellently true. In my youth it was the man of the world who set the fashions. Now it is the tailor and the young sir, fresh from his studies.' 
What should these persons know of the subject? Balnillo was in heaven. From force of habit he ran his hand down the leg crossed upon his knee. The familiar inward curve of the slim silk ankle between his fingers was like the touch of a tried and creditable friend. It might almost be said that he turned to it for sympathy. He would have liked to tell his ankle that to-night he had found a perfection almost as great as its own. Lord Grange, who had taken leave of his hostess and was departing, paused to look at him. "'See,' said he, taking an acquaintance by the elbow, "'look yonder at that doited Davy Balnillo.' "'He's telling her about his riding of the circuit,' said the other, grinning. "'The circuit never made him smile like that,' replied Grange sardonically. An hour later Christian Flemington stood at the top of the circular staircase. Below it Balnillo was at the entrance door, sending everyone within reach of his voice in search of her sedan chair. When it was discovered, he escorted her down and handed her into it. Then, according to the custom of the time, he prepared to attend its progress to her lodgings in Hinesford's clothes. The streets were even dirtier and damper than before, but he was as anxious to walk from Lady Anne's party as he had been determined to be carried to it. He stepped along at the side of the chair, turning, when they passed a light, to see the dignified silhouette of Madame Flemington's head as it appeared in shadow against the farther window. Speech was impossible as they went, for avoidance of the kennel and the worse obstacles that strewed the city at that hour, before the scavengers had gone their rounds, kept David busy. The only profit that a man got by seeing his admired one home in Edinburgh in 1745 was the honour and glory of it. When she emerged from the chair in Hinesford's clothes, he insisted upon mounting the staircase with her, though its narrowness compelled them to go in single file, and when they stopped halfway up at the door in the towering land, he bade her good night and descended again consoled for the parting by her permission that he should wait upon her on the following day. Christian was admitted and sailed into her little room. A light was in it, and Archie was standing at the foot of the bed. Surprises had been rolling up round Madame Flemington all the evening. Surprise at meeting Balnillo, surprise at his attitude, and this crowning surprise of all. She was bewildered, but the blessing of unexpected relief fell on her. She went towards him, her hands outstretched, and Flemington, who was looking at her with a wistfulness she had never seen in him before, took them and held them fast. Oh, Archie, she exclaimed. She could say no more. They sat down at the wide hearth together, the shadow of the great carved bed sprawling over the crowded space between the walls, and over Christian's swelling silks. Then he told her the history of the time since they parted in Ardguy's garden, of his boarding of the venture, of the fight with the rebels at Inchbrayock, of his meeting with Wattie, of how he had reached Aberbrothock half dead and had lain sick for two days in an obscure tavern by the shore, how he had finally sailed for Leith and had reached Edinburgh. Christian heard him, her gaze fixed upon the fire. She had elicited nothing about James Logie from Balnillo, and there was no word of him in Archie's story. She longed to speak of him, but would not. She longed to know if the beggar had told the truth in saying that the two men had actually fought, but she asked nothing, for she knew that her wisest part was to accept the essentials, considering them as the whole. She would ask no questions. Archie had come back. She had forbidden Ardguys to him, and he had evaded her ban by coming here. Yet he came, having proved himself loyal, and she would ignore the rest. End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of Flemington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Recording by Nan Dodge. Flemington by Violet Jacob. Chapter 19. The Winter. April is slow in Scotland, distrustful of her own identity, timid of her own powers. Half days from the long winter sleep, she is often bewildered and cannot remember whether she belongs to winter or to spring. After the struggles and perplexities of the months that had elapsed since Balnillo and Christian Flemington met in Edinburgh, she had come slowly to herself amid storms of sleet. Beyond the Grampians in the north, her awakened eyes looked on a country whose heart had been broken at Culloden. The ragged company that gathered round its prince on that Wednesday morning was dispersed among the fastnesses of the hills, or lying dead and dying among the rushes and heather, whilst Cumberland soldiers finished their bloody business. The April snow that had blown in the faces of the clansmen as they hurled their unavailing valour on the Whig army had melted upon mounds of slain, and in the struggle of an hour the hopes of half a century had perished. Superior numbers, superior artillery, and superior generalship had done their work. When the English dragoons had recovered themselves after the highland charge, they pursued almost to the gates of Inverness, returning again to the battlefield before night should darken upon the carnage, to despatch the wounded wretches who still breathed among their dead comrades. The country smelt of blood, reeked of it. For miles and miles round Inverness, where the search for fugitives was hottest, burnt hovels and blackened walls made blots upon the tardy green of spring. Women went about, white-faced and silent, trying to keep from their eyes the self-betraying consciousness of hidden terrors, each striving to forget the peat-stack on the moor where some hunted creature was lying, the scrub in the hollow that sheltered some wounded body, the cranny in the hill to which she must journey painfully after dark with the crusts in her apron. The shot still rattled out over the countryside where the search was going on, and where, when it had been successful, a few maimed and haggard men stood along some shiling wall in front of a platoon of Cumberland's musketry. All down the shores of Loch Ness and among the hills above the Nairn, water southwest of Culloden, the dark rocks raised their broken heads to the sky over God knows what agonies of suffering and hunger. The carrion crow was busy in the land. One-fifth of Prince Charles's army was dead upon the battlefield, and the church and toll-booth of Inverness were full of wounded prisoners to whom none, not even the surgeons of their own party, were suffered to attend. And so April passed, and May was near her passing. Cumberland lay at Fort Augustus, to which place he had retired, with Kingston's horse and eleven battalions of foot. The victorious army was the richer by much spoil, and money was free. The Duke's camp was merry with festivities and races, and in the midst of it he enjoyed a well-earned leisure, enlivened by women and dice. He had performed his task of stamping out the danger that threatened his family with admirable thoroughness, and he had, besides, the comfortable prospect of a glorious return to London, where he would be the hero of the general rejoicing that was to follow. He was rooted at Fort Augustus, a rock of success and convivial self-satisfaction in the flood of tears and anguish and broken aspiration that had drowned half Scotland. The prince had begun his wanderings in the west, hiding among the hills and quarries of the islands, followed by a few faithful souls, and with a price of thirty thousand pounds on his head, whilst Cumberland's emissaries, chief among whom was John Campbell of Mamore, commandant of the West Highland garrisons, searched the country in every direction. The rank and file of his army, such of his men as were not dead or in prison were scattered to the four winds, and those officers who had escaped after Culloden were in hiding too, some despairing, some holding yet to the forlorn hope of raising his standard anew when the evil day should be over. Among these last was James Logie. 
He had come unhurt through the battle. Complete indifference about personal issues had wrapped him round in a protecting atmosphere, as it seems to enwrap and protect the unconcerned among men. He had left the field in company with the prince and a few friends, with whom he reached the ford of Fally on the Narn River. They had held a rapid council at this place, Prince Charles desiring that the remnant of his army should rendezvous at Ruthven in Badenoch while he made his way to France, for his hopes were living still, and he still looked for support and supplies from the French king. He had taken leave of his companions at the ford, and had set off with half a dozen followers for the coast. Logie turned his face towards Angus. He had been a conspicuous figure in the prince's immediate circle, and he knew that he had no time to lose if he was to cross the Grampians alive. He thirsted to get back and to test the temper of the east coast after the news of the reverse. Like his master, he was not beaten yet. He did not know what had become of Ferrier and the Angus men, for he had been on the prince's staff. But the friends had met on the night before the battle, and it was a compact between them, that should the day go against them, and should either or both survive the fight, they were to make for the neighborhood of Forfar, where they would be ready, in case of necessity, to begin on their task of raising new levies for the cause. He had reached the Spey, and had gained Deeside and safety by the shores of the Avon, crossing the Grampians near the sources of the Isla. In the long winter that had passed since he joined the prince in the field, James had not forgotten Flemington. His own labors in Angus, and at the taking of the venture, completely as they had filled his mind in the autumn, had sunk back into the limbo of insignificant things. But Archie was often in his thoughts, and some time before the advance on Inverness, he had heard with indescribable feelings that he was intelligence officer to the Duke of Cumberland. The terrible thing to Logie was that Archie's treachery seemed to have poisoned the sacred places in his own past. When he turned back to it now, it was as though the figure of the young man stood blocking his view, looking at him with those eyes that were so like the eyes of Diane, and were yet the eyes of a traitor. He could not bear to think of that October morning by the basin of Montrose. Perhaps the story that a fatal impulse had made him lay bare to his companion had been tossed about, a subject of ridicule on Flemington's lips, its telling but one more proof to him of the folly of men. He could scarcely believe that Archie would treat the record of his anguish in such a way, but then neither could he have believed that the sympathy in Archie's face, the break in his voice, the tension of his listening attitude, were only the stock in trade of a practised spy. And yet this horror had been true. In spite of the unhealed wound that he carried, in spite of the batterings of his thirty-eight years, Logie had continued to love life, but now he had begun to tell himself that he was sick of it. And for another very practical reason, his generous impulses and his belief in Flemington had undone him. Perhaps if the young painter had come to Balnillo, announcing an ostentatious adherence to the Stuarts, he might have hesitated before taking him at his own value. But his apparent caution and his unwillingness to speak, and the words about his father at St. Germain, which he had let fall with all the quiet dignity of a man too upright to pass under false colours, had done more to put the brothers on the wrong track than the most violent protestations. Balnillo had been careful, in spite of his confidence in his guest, but in the sympathy of his soul James had given Flemington the means of future access to himself. Now the tavern in the castle wind at Stirling could be of use to him no longer, and he knew that only the last extremity must find him in any of the secret haunts known to him in the Muir of Pert. Madam Flemington had never reopened the subject of James Logie with Archie. In her wisdom she had left well alone. Installed in her little lodging in Hinesford's clothes, with her woman, Mysie, she had made up her mind to remain where she was. There was much to keep her in Edinburgh, 
and she could not bring herself to leave the center of information and to bury herself again in the old white house among the ash trees whilst every post and every horseman brought word of some new turn in the country's fortunes news of the highland army's retreat to scotland of the battle of falkirk of the despatch of the duke of cumberland to the north followed one another as the year went by and still she stayed on with her emergence from the seclusion of the country came her emergence from the seclusion she had made for herself and on the duke's thirty hours occupation of holyrood she threw off all pretense of neutrality and repaired with other whig ladies to the palace to pay her respects to the stout ill-mannered young general whose unbeguiling person followed so awkwardly upon the attractive figure of his predecessor now that archie was restored to her christian found herself with plenty of occupation the contempt she had hitherto professed for edinburgh society seemed to have melted away and every card party every assembly and rout knew her chair at its door her arresting presence in its midst madame flemington's name was on a good many tongues that winter many feared her some maligned her but no one overlooked her the fact that she was the widow of an exiled jacobite lent her an additional interest and as the polite world set itself to invent a motley choice of reasons for her adherence to the house of hanover which it discovered before her reception by the duke at holyrood made it public it ended by stumbling on the old story of a bygone liaison with prince charles's father the idea was so much to its taste that it was generally accepted and christian unknown to herself became the cast-off and alienated mistress of that prince whom her party had begun to call the old pretender it was scarcely a legend that would have conciliated her had it come to her ears but as rumor is seldom on speaking terms with its victims she was ignorant of the interested whispers which followed her through the winds and up the staircases of the old town but the reflected halo of royalty while it casts deep shadows reaches far the character of royal light of love stood her in good stead even among those to whom her supposed former lover was an abhorred spectre of popery and political danger the path that her own personality would surely open for her in any community was illumined and made smooth by the baleful interest that hangs about all kingly irregularities and there was that in her bearing which made people think more of the royal and less of the irregular part of the business also among the whigs she was a brand plucked from the burning one who had turned from the wrong party to embrace the right edinburgh whig at heart in spite of its backslidings admired madame flemington and not only edinburgh but that curious fraction of it david balnillo the impression that christian had made upon the judge had deepened as the weeks went by by the time he discovered her true principles and realized that she was no dupe of archie's but his partisan he had advanced so far in his acquaintance with her had become so much her servant that he could not bring himself to draw back she had dazzled his wits and played on his vanity and that vanity was not only warmed and cosseted by her manner to him not only was he delighted with herself and her notice but he had begun to find in his position a favored cavalier to one of the most prominent figures in society a distinction that it would go hard with him to miss he had begun their conversation at lady anne maxwell's party by the mention of archie flemington but his name had not come up between them again and when his enlightenment about her was complete and the talk which he heard in every house that he frequented revealed her in her real colors he had no further wish to discuss the man into whose trap he had fallen david balnillo's discoveries were extremely unpalatable to him if christian had cherished his vanity she had made it smart too no man least of all one like the self-appreciative judge can find without resentment that he has been even indirectly 
the dupe of a person to whom he has attached himself. But when that person is a woman, determined not to let him escape from her influence, the case is not always desperate. For three unblessed days it was well-nigh desperate with Balnillo, and he avoided her completely. But at the end of that time a summons from her was brought to him, that his inclination for her company and the chance sight of Lord Grange holding open the door of her chair forbade him to obey. She had worded her command as though she were conferring a favour. Nevertheless, after an hour's hesitation, David had taken his hat and repaired to Hinesford's clothes, dragging his dignity after him like a dog on a leash. If she guessed the reason of his absence from her side, she made no remark, receiving him as if she had just parted from him, with that omission of greeting which implies so much. She had sent for him, she said, because her man of business had given her a legal paper that she would not sign without his advice. She looked him in the face as fearlessly as ever, and her glance sparkled with its wonted fire. For some tormented minutes he could not decide whether or no to charge her with knowledge of the fraud that had been carried on under his roof, but he had not the courage to do so. Also, he was acute enough to see that she might well reply to his reproaches by reminding him that he had only himself to thank for their acquaintance. She had not made the advances. His own zeal had brought about their situation. He felt like a fool, but he saw that in speaking he might look like one, which some consider worse. He left her, assuring himself that all was fair in love and politics, that he could not, in common good breeding, withhold his help from her in her legal difficulty, that, should wind of Archie's dealings with him get abroad in the town, he would be saving appearances in avoiding a rupture with the lady whose shadow he had been since he arrived in Edinburgh, and that it was his duty, as a well-wisher of Prince Charles, to keep open any channel that might yield information about Flemington's movements. Whatsoever may have been the quality of his reasons, their quantity was remarkable. He did not like the little voice that whispered to him that he would not have dared to offer them to James. There was no further risk of a meeting with Archie, for within a few days of the latter's appearance in Hinesford's clothes, he had been sent to the border with instructions to watch Jedborough and the neighbourhood of Liddesdale, through which the Prince's army had passed on its march to England. Madame Flemington knew that the coast was clear, and David had no suspicion that it had been otherwise. Very few people in Edinburgh were aware of Flemington's visit to it. It was an event of which even the caddies were ignorant. And so Balnillo lingered on, putting off his return to Angus from week to week. His mouse-coloured velvet began to show signs of wear, and was replaced by a suit of dark purple. His funds were dwindling a little, for he was not a rich man, and a new set of verses about him was going the round of the town. Then with January came the Battle of Falkirk, and the Siege of Stirling Castle, in the end of the month brought Cumberland and the mustering of loyal Whigs to wait upon him at Holyrood Palace. David departed quietly. He had come to Edinburgh to avoid playing a marked part in Angus, and he now returned to Angus to avoid playing a marked part in Edinburgh. He was behaving like the last remaining king in a game of draughts when he skips from square to square in the safe corner of the board but he did not know that government had kept its eye on all his doings during the time of his stay. Perhaps it was on account of her usefulness in this and in other delicate matters that Madame Flemington augured well for her grandson, for when the Whig army crossed the Forth, Archie went with it as intelligence officer to the Duke of Cumberland. End of chapter 19